Hi, my name is Robin Atkins. I'm a licensed mental health counselor and the chair of the mental health subsection of the American Association of Pro-Life OBGYNs. And I just wanna thank Support After Abortion for having me and for all of you for attending um, this talk today on abortion and mental health. I probably will bump right up against the initial 45 minutes to share with you. Um, so if I skip some slides, just um, know that there will be a link to this presentation later and you can check those out more fully. But I just wanna really give you time to answer, ask some questions and get some answers to those questions. So this presentation is gonna go in three parts. The first part of the presentation is the American Psychological Association and abortion. The second part of the presentation is on the history of research studies on abortion and suicide. I narrowed it to that because when you look at the entire history of research on mental health and abortion, it's so vast, it would be really hard to cover all of that in one presentation. So I narrowed it to that topic. And then our last, um, section of today's presentation is regarding the Turnaway Study, which is most often quoted regarding mental health and abortion currently. So let's get started. The American Psychological Association has a history of an abortion advocacy organization. So they've over throughout the years, they made a few statements regarding abortion. And I wanted to point these out to you so you can understand as an organization, they're supposed to be supporting what is evidence-based and what is best for the practice of psychology. What they're doing instead is becoming an advocate, advocacy organization based on ideology. So in 1969, they adopted a resolution on abortion declaring abortion a civil right based on the belief that termination of unwanted pregnancies is clearly a mental health and child welfare issue. This is shocking to me because abortion is not an evidence-based mental health treatment. It's not a mental health treatment at all. So it's shocking to me that they would say that it's a right based on mental health. In 1980, they affirmed the right for qualified researchers to conduct appropriate research. However, they don't really say what constitutes qualified researchers and what's appropriate research. It is interesting though, in all the research that they cite for their claims, they never cite any of the research that shows there are mental health complications in abortion. So that makes me wonder really who they think is qualified and what type of research is appropriate. In 1989, they declared abortion was necessary, especially for poor women, and stated that uninformed public statements and lack of understanding can create emotional distress. This in particular was fascinating to me. We see a huge disparity with poor women and access to mental health, and for them to suggest that abortion is an answer is just shocking to me. In 1992, they joined Planned Parenthood in declaring adolescents had a constitutional right to make informed reproductive decisions. This is also shocking to me, given in mental health, when we have adolescents coming to us for therapy, each state is different on the age that a child can enter into mental health counseling with or without parental consent. But every therapist, it's on our license, how much we decide, how much confidentiality we decide that adolescent gets and it behooves us to determine if a child doesn't want their parents involved, why not? And if there's issues involving neglect or abuse, us to report those. So moving along, in 2008, the American Psychological Association put out a manual regarding abortion and mental health. And in that manual, they gave a list of pre-existing risk factors for mental health complications after abortion. And what's interesting is, any mental health issues after abortion, they blamed on those pre-existing risk factors, but they still didn't think that women needed to be notified that those pre-existing risk factors could cause complications after abortion. So basically what they're saying, abortion isn't causing the mental health complications and it's pre-existing mental health risks, then why don't we need to notify the women that those pre-existing mental health risks could cause serious mental health complications after abortion? It also suggests that Abortion isn't helping with mental health complications. And um, there's some research that was done by Priscilla Coleman in 2018 that found the most important predictor of PTSD, anxiety, and depression was how the woman viewed the pregnancy and how wanted or emotionally invested she was in the pregnancy. And I just wanna tie in another little piece of this. Um, in the mental health community, we don't use the term post-abortion syndrome. It's not a mental health diagnosis. It's not recognized as one in the mental health community. Most often when I see clients that have some kind of severe complication related to 
abortion or an abortion experience, it will be diagnosed with PTSD, panic disorder, acute stress disorder, but post-abortion syndrome is not a mental health diagnosis. So some interesting quotes from the 2008 APA report. Characteristics of the woman also predicted more negative psychological experiences after a first trimester abortion, including a prior history of mental health problems, personality factors such as low self-esteem and low perceived control over her life, and the use of avoidance and denial coping strategies. What you'll see a little bit later in one of my slides is those are typically the reasons women are seeking out abortions, along with financial concerns and domestic violence concerns. So those predict more negative psychological experiences after are also the reasons they're seeking abortion. This should be really concerning to the mental health community. Another quote, to say that women in general do not show an increased incident of mental health problems following a single abortion does not mean that no women experience such problems. So right in their own report, they're acknowledging some women do, yet they don't think women need to be informed prior to an abortion as far as, as part of informed consent that this is happening. So David Ferguson was a researcher um, and he conducted research based on medical records. Um, and his he also happened to be pro-choice and atheist. And the only reason I include those facts about him is because what his research found tends to be leaning towards we need to, well, it doesn't tend to, it actually leans directly towards we need to be informing women of potential mental health complications. And he talked about how difficult it was to get his research um, shown to, or published by anyone in America. He had to get it published outside of America. America's journals basically said to him, nope, that is too political of a position. We are not gonna accept it into our journals. But this is what he said about the American Psychological Association. The American Psychological Association report, in fact, does draw a very strong and dogmatic conclusion that cannot be defended on the basis of evidence since this evidence is lacking by the admission of the report. As I stated to the APA committee in my review of an earlier draft, the only scientifically defensible position to take is that the evidence in the area is inconsistent and contested. Under these conditions, the only scientifically defensible conclusion is to recognize the uncertainty in the evidence and propose better research and greater investments in this area. What the committee has in effect said is that until there is compelling evidence to the contrary, people should act as though abortion has no harmful, contact, no harmful effects. This is not a defensible position in a situation in which there is evidence pointing to the direct, in the direction of harmful effects. So he's basically calling out the APA saying, hey, in order to protect women, we need to acknowledge that there is actually evidence that there are harmful mental health effects following abortion. So in 2011, we're gonna switch over now to the portion of the, um, seminar on how suicide and abortion are related. In 2011, a meta-analysis meta by Col Coleman et al. Um, looked at 877,000 women of whom 163,000 had had an abortion. And when they compared unintended pregnancies, unintended pregnancies that were delivered um, versus intended pregnancies that were delivered, what they found was an overall 81% higher risk of mental health problems with 10% of those directly attributed to the abortion. So it's really important for all of us to understand and to speak correctly when we're talking about these percentages. We don't wanna be misleading. We don't need to be dishonest about it. These are correlated. So these are abortions correlated with these results. It's only causated if we can say they're directly attributed to the abortion. So there was 81% higher risk of mental health problems correlated with having had an abortion. 10% of the 81% was directly attributed to the abortion. There was correlated 230% increased risk of use of marijuana, 155% increased risk of suicidal behaviors. This is really what I want you to take note of, these suicidal behavior numbers. So in this particular study, 155% risk increase. Coleman's um, research came under fire by a lot of the pro-abortion lobby. And Ferguson, again, who was pro-choice, stepped in to defend Coleman. And not only did he defend her saying, no, 
there's clear that we have alert that there's some kind of elevated risk of mental health problems among women who have abortions. He did his own analysis and he found the implications of this analysis are inescapable despite the claims made in previous reviews about the absence of association between abortion and mental health. When data is pooled across studies, there is consistent evidence suggesting that women having abortions are at modestly, modestly increased risks of mental health problems when compared with women coming to term with unplanned and unwanted pregnancies. David Ferguson also did a research study on whether abortion reduces the mental health risks during unwanted or unintended pregnancies. There was consistent evidence to show that abortion was not associated with any reduction in rates of mental health problems. So if a woman's coming into the clinic with previous mental health problems, the abortion didn't help solve any of those at all, which is somewhat consistent with the APA who claims previous mental health problems are still existing after the abortion. Now, whether or not the abortion contributed or added to the mental health complications or made them worse is a separate thing, but consistently abortion is not solving the mental health complications. He also showed that abortion was associated with a small to moderate increased risk of anxiety. And again, down at the bottom, you see suicide societal behavior, that's a 69% increased risk of suicide following abortion. In 1995, Gil Chris published um, a really interesting study was comparing women that had no history of psychological illness and 70% increased risk of deliberate self-harm after abortion when compared to women who birthed. So these both of these groups were women with no history of psychological illness, 70% increased risk of deliberate self-harm for the women who had had abortions. In 1996, there was a Finnish study. Again, these are medical records that are open. Um, and when they compared suicide rates using public health records, they found that it was a 5.9 number of women per 100,000 that had committed suicide after birth, 34.7 per 100,000 after abortion. And most of those deaths were within the first two months. This should be shocking and jarring to anyone who is concerned about women's health. After miscarriage, it's worth noting too, there was an 18.1 incident of women per 100,000. So any type of pregnancy loss shows an increased risk of suicide. In 2006, Ferguson report, um, published another report showing a 27% increase of suicidal ideations and a four times greater risk for suicide after abortion when compared to never being pregnant three times greater risk for suicide after abortion when compared to women who deliver. And I hope you're starting to notice the theme in these studies. In 2002, David Reardon looked at public health records of 173,000 women on California Medicaid, and he looked at the abortions that occurred in 1989 and health incidents that occurred between 1989 and 1997. So abortion occurs in 1989, and then these are the incidents that occurred after the abortion, 1989 to 1997. And what he found was overall a 62% increased death rate for women who had had abortions in those following years compared to women who didn't. 154% increased suicide rate in women who had had an abortion compared to women who did not in those following years. 82% increase in accidents, 44% increase in natural deaths, 118% increase for AIDS-related deaths, 187% increased risks for circulatory diseases and a 446% increased risk of death for cerebral vascular diseases. So what this should tell us overall is women seeking abortion may be ha may have more mental health complications and more physical health complications. The abortion that they're having is clearly not addressing these issues because following abortion there's a huge risk of both physical and mental health complications. In 2010, Moda and All released um, some findings they had found from a national survey of medical records. I believe it was in Canada. And it showed a 59% increased risk in suicidal ideation with 5.8% of that directly attributed to abortion. And then you can also see on this slide, there's a whole host of other mental health complications that they found increased risks of. In 2015, Geisler et al. was comparing the suicide rate of reproductive age women using public records. And these records were from Finland from 1987 to 2012. And it 
team discovered that the rate doubled for those who had not birthed a child. So this is really interesting. This is kind of looking at the situation flipped upside down. For women with no birth history, there was 11.3 incidents of suicide per 100,000. For women who had birth children, the rate almost dropped by half, 5.9%. They also found the risk for suicide amongst women who had had an induced abortion was two times greater than non-pregnant women and occurred within one year of the abortion. So it seems that there's some type of a protective factor against suicide when women have births um, compared to women who do not. So David Reardon in 2018 published a wonderful um, literature review of a lot of the mental health and abortion research that had been done up until that point. And he compiled the data from a lot of different research. And the research was from all different types of researchers. It wasn't researchers who are personally pro-life or just researchers that are personally pro-choice. It was research from a lot of different people. And he found in that research consistently abortion was correlated with a 600% increased risk of depression, a 200% increased risk of suicide, and 150% increased risk of drug and alcohol use or abuse. Now, again, we, we don't know necessarily if those increased risks are due to the abortion itself, or if it was the abortion kicked them off or was some kind of triggering event or was unrelated. But we do know that women with depression, suicidal ideation or mental health complications or drug or alcohol use and abuse are more likely to seek abortion and that the abortion is not solving these mental health issues for them. In 2020, Lega and all published research from public health records from 2006 to 2012 in Italy. So this is relatively recent research. And what they discovered regarding rates of suicide was for those who had given birth, women who had given birth, it was 1.18 per 100,000, 2.77 per 100,000 after abortion. So quite a jump just from giving birth to having had an abortion. And then after miscarriage, 2.9 per 100,000. So for those women experiencing pregnancy loss, it was a considerable jump um, compared to women who had given birth and their rates of suicide. And so these are actual suicides that happened, 2.77 per 100,000, 2.9 per 100,000. And the majority of these women did have previous psychiatric histories. And that's important to note when we get later on in the presentation to the research that's been published in the last couple months, we'll take a look at that as well. Consistently throughout the research, we're showing women with previous psychiatric histories are having higher rates of suicide post-abortion. Okay, so I threw this slide in here just to give you an idea of what we think about when we think about women or girls who are seeking abortions. Coleman did a research of minors seeking abortion and of the 40, 176 minors seeking abortion, 31% reported thinking abortion was the same to them as killing a baby that has already been born. 49% noted spiritual concerns with abortion and 24% stated they were concerned about God forgiving them. So when we think about women having an abortion or girls having an abortion, a lot of times it's easy to consider them as women that are uncaring or unaware or unkind or hateful to their children. But the reality is women seeking abortion or girls seeking abortion often face conflicting emotions about it and concerns about what it would mean for them moving forward. And this would suggest that we need real informed consent and real pre-abortion and post-abortion counseling for women and girls that are experiencing abortions. So this is a slide I was mentioning earlier about why women seek abortion. So on the left of the screen is the list of risks, pre-existing risk factors that the APA had acknowledged for mental health complications after abortion. And on the right of the screen is the reasons that, I'm sorry, I had that swapped, forgive me. On the left of the screen is the reasons women seek abortion. On the right of the screen is the risk for mental health problems after an abortion. And we color coded those so you could see how many overlap. So if there's a lack of perceived social support from others, for example, there as a risk factor for having mental health complications post-abortion, you can look on the left side of the screen and see all the things in green that fit in with the lack of perceived social support from others. 
feelings of stigma, perceived need for secrecy on the right as a risk factor for mental health problems after abortion, as identified by the APA, don't want people to know I had sex or got pregnant, as a reason women or children or girls are seeking abortion. This study was a really small study done out of Norway, and it was a study asking pre-abortion counselors, mental health workers, um, and actually they weren't mental health workers, I apologize, they were um, health workers in the hospitals, how they counseled women coming in who were ambivalent about abortion. And this is a very small study, like I said, it was 40 um, counselors, so it's not generalizable to the entirety of pre-abortion counseling that happens all over the world, but it was really shocking to me what I saw happening in these pre-counseling sessions. Women's wording were changed. If a woman came in saying my child, they corrected her to say fetus, embryo, or pregnancy, or product of conception. If a woman might have been pregnant with multiples, they were choosing not to tell her that or show her on the ultrasound. And if women asked to see ultrasound, they encouraged them not to, as it would be conflicting and harmful for them to see them. These are incidents that go against informed consent. If a woman is coming in to seeking an abortion and she's ambivalent or concerned about an abortion and she's using terminology of my child, that terminology should be matched by whoever's counseling with her. If a client comes into my office seeking help and whatever terminology she uses, is how I match back with her. If she uses the term fetus, that's the term I use. I don't correct her verbiage because that's how she's seeing the situation. And we need to be mindful of how we talk to women who have both looking at having abortion, who have had abortions. Um, it's really interesting to watch women in my office who come in who have some kind of complication from abortion. And if they're pro-choice, they kind of go through this how they talk about it. They start out talking about it like a fetus, but when it gets to their grief, they start talking about their child. And it can be the same for pro-life as well. If they're ideologically pro-life and they come in, they sometimes start talking about it like a fetus and end up talking about their child. And it's a, it's a path or a journey that they go on. And so when we're meeting with women, or even if we're online or at an event um, or in public talking about abortion with women, we need to be mindful about how we talk about it and how other women are receiving, and men too, are receiving our words about abortion. So now I wanna switch over to the Turnaway study. And the whole reason we're doing this study in depth alone is because it's one that's most often quoted. Um, there's been a book written about it, and now there's, I believe, some kind of um, education series where you can get credentialed on it or something like that. So I thought we definitely should address it, as well as the APA is using stats from the Turnaway study um, as support for their claims that there are no mental health complications for women having abortion. So how the Turnaway study was done was across 30 different um, abortion clinics in the U.S., abortion workers would go up to a woman after having an abortion and ask her if she would like to participate in the study. 300, I'm sorry, 3,045 women were asked to participate. Only 37% agreed to participate. We don't know why the other 63% didn't agree to participate. We don't know what looks they had on their faces. We don't know what their body language was. We don't know anything about them. And then throughout the study, there was significant dropout rates. So the women were interviewed. Their first interview was eight days post-abortion. And then they were interviewed again throughout a five-year period. And throughout that five-year period, we continue to see women dropping out. Before, between their abortion and eight days later, 15.5% dropped out. A 27% of the women initially invited, the 3,045, only 27% participated in the six month interview. And then at the end of the study, five years later, only 17% of the women asked to participate, the 3,045, remained in the study. Okay, so the APA, in the APA's list of risk factors for mental health complications after abortion can somewhat explain the refusal to participate or drop out in the study. Perceived pressure from others to terminate might be a reason why they don't wanna participate in the study if they were coerced. Feelings of stigma 
about abortion could be a reason they didn't want to participate. Avoidance or denial coping strategies, which are also, by the way, symptoms of PTSD, but not wanting to deal with the fact or think about the fact that they actually had an abortion might be a reason that they drop out or refuse to participate. A perceived need for secrecy or abortion for fetal anomaly, which this group was actually excluded from the study. They were not part of the study, so I don't wanna confuse you, but I wanted to let you know that's on the APA's list of risk factors for mental health complications. Okay, so we look at selection bias. First of all, these participants were recruited by abortion clinic staff members. There may have been their own selection bias. They may have omitted women who clearly looked more distressed. And that could have been out of kindness on their part. That woman looks really upset. I'm not gonna approach her and ask her to participate in a study. That would seem uncompassionate or incompassionate. Um, the, in the protocol published by um, Insure, each um, recruiter for the study was given free range on how they approached women. So we don't know what they said to women or how they said it. There was no standard protocol for how to do that. Um, they were given flexibility and what timing they went or chose to seek out the women. So was it right after the woman had an abortion? Was it when she was in the recovery room? Was it when she was walking up to her car? Was she alone? Did she have support with her? We don't know any of those questions. And even the parent company that designed the study admitted that women who report the highest rate of relief or happiness were more likely to remain in the study and women who reported the least amount of relief and the most negative feelings were the most likely to drop out of the study. And also they present the study as if the findings as if it's generalizable to the entire population. However, the of the population of women having abortions, 90% of women are in the first trimester and it's not due to any medical health reasons. This particular study had 254 women having an abortion during the first trimester, but 413 of women having abortions at the end of their second trimester. That's not generalizable to the population of women having abortions. And the control did not control for women already exposed to a problem pregnancy, women had, who had already gone through the process of seeking an abortion, or women who had already had multiple pregnancy experiences, previous abortions, miscarriages, or births. So now we look at how they framed the findings. One thing I found particularly problematic is the idea that regret is the single reaction women have to abortion. They either regret it or they don't. This isn't really how women experience abortion. Abortion has a wide range of emotions. So for example, in my own abortion, I am super grateful that I am not tied to an abuser for the rest of my life. However, I'm extremely regretful that I don't have my son with me. And if I could go back and do it again, I would not have done it. I would have faced the abuser for the opportunity to know my son. So the, it's a complicated reaction to abortion. It's not simple regret or not regret. And it's really concerning that that's how they're framing the mental health experience of abortion. For the women that were actually denied abortion, the entire study was called the turn away study. It was supposed to be regarding the women who were turned away from abortion. When compared to having an abortion, being a denied abortion may be associated with a greater risk of initially experiencing adverse psychological outcomes. And the study, and multiple studies have shown in the first week, there can tend to be a little bit of increase in dissatisfaction, stress, um, irritation, depression. After that, it significantly drops off. And then the women turned away in this study overwhelmingly became pro-life and were extremely grateful that they had their children. What was interesting too, and a lot of the papers written about this study, they'll talk about how much worse these women are. Um, they are worse financially. They have more health issues. They have lower incomes. Um, what's kind of interesting is they didn't really mention that there's a lot of confounding variables in that. The women turned away tend to be much younger than the women who had abortions and younger meaning early 20s, late teens. So obviously their income levels are going to be much lower than women who are having abortions mid, late 20s, early 30s. Um, also, those women, again, were extremely grateful. They did not consider their children to be a hardship or their life to be a hardship, yet that's how their life is being talked about. 
So there's some unpublished findings in the Turnaway study. And those are findings that you have to dig apart and nitpick apart the Turnaway study to see them because they don't really wanna talk about those. And I already talked about one of those, which is the women turned away were significantly younger than the other groups. They had different rates of employment than the other groups. They were more likely to live with family members at prior to and at the time of the abortion. And they often did not answer questions, particularly financial ones. There's huge data gaps from the women that were turned away from abortion in the follow-up interviews. There was no control for mental health, financial health, relational health, or medical health prior to the abortion for any of these groups. Because these women were approached right after their abortion, there was no information regarding, did they have prior mental health issues? Did they have prior financial health issues? Did they have prior relational health issues? What the Turnaway Study Group did was they dug up their credit reporting agency um, information and tried to use that information to fill in the gaps. I don't know if you've ever pulled your credit report agency information, but I can tell you mine does not give a complete picture of what my financial status is, who I live with, who else is involved in my financial status. Um, it's definitely not an accurate picture of what these women are experiencing. And again, we would expect women who are younger, who live with their family, who have less income at the time of their abortion, would even up to five years later, still be experiencing some of those same situations. There was no anonymity in the study. So the women being approached were obviously known by those who are approaching them and by the people following up with them. So if, you're, if you have less anonymity, that previous mental health complication risk factor of the need for secrecy is no longer there. Um, a single yes or no question was used to assess the satisfaction of abortion. So that was it, one question with, are you satisfied or are you not? No nuance regarding what parts are you satisfied with? Were you really just satisfied that you didn't have the stress of the financial, what you saw as a financial burden? Are you satisfied that you're no longer with your abuser? It was just a yes or no. We don't know what women's idea of satisfaction was or if it was more complicated than that. Women were never asked if they saw any steps to reduce negative emotions regarding abortion. So for women who had five years later, less negative response to abortion, had they received any counseling? Had they talked to a pastor? Had they talked to friends? Had they been part of a group? Were they part of a um, post-abortion recovery group? We don't know any of that information. The women who were turned away from the study were a very small number of women, around 200, who were turned away due to being over gestational age limits. And within that group of 200 women, there were actually women who went and sought out abortion at other clinics and received them, as well as women who ended up miscarrying or experiencing stillbirth. So this actually isn't really a clear comparison of the two groups between women who were turned away and women who had abortions, because in the turned away group, we have women who actually did have abortions or miscarriages and stillbirths. That complicates the answers they would be giving considerably. The researchers has, at, have, as of today, refused to share their complete questionnaires, how they did a detail of the, or the details of their analysis of the study or the data they used for reanalysis, meaning this research cannot be duplicated. And that's one of the standards for quality research is can it be duplicated? And yet this study is being promoted as the best study on mental health and abortion ever done. Over the studies using actual medical records of women showing correlations, huge correlations between risk for suicide after abortion, those are being considered garbage compared to a study that we can't even duplicate with serious methodological flaws throughout it and a tiny group of women being representative of a huge group of women. So overall, about 500 women, and we're told based on 500 women's responses, that's supposed to represent over 30 million women's abortion experiences. So I wanted to let you know how they tested for emotional reaction to abortion. They used a five point Likert scale. So that's kind of like one would be no, not at all, five would be all the time or yes. Um, and they studied for six emotions, relief, happiness, regret, guilt, sadness, and anger. The scores of the four negative emotions were grouped together for a single score. So regret, guilt, sadness, and anger were all grouped together in one single score. The scores for two positive emotions, relief and happiness, were grouped together for a single store, score. 
So we don't actually know what wide or nuanced range of emotions women had. We didn't know if they had relief and anger, relief and guilt, happiness and sadness, both happiness and regret, 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 guilt, and relief. We don't really know what women were experiencing after abortion because all of this were grouped into two scores. Oh, I, one more thing. I'm sorry, I wanted to add. No current accepted standard scale of psychological health was used for this assessment. They made up their own scale using their own five-point Likert um, scale and picked these emotions. And none of this is standard psychological health assessment. Okay, it looks like I've already covered the information in this slide, so I'm gonna skip over it. So I wanna jump now to research findings that we have in this year, in the last couple months. So David Reardon looked at medical records of 1,939,000 women between 1999 and 2012. Women with a prior pregnancy loss were 35% more likely to have a postpartum psychiatric treatment after a subsequent live birth. So they had some type of pregnancy loss and then later had a live birth. And after their live birth, 35% of them experienced a postpartum psychiatric treatment event. 58% of those 35 were women who had their first mental health treatment after pregnancy loss. And the risk of inpatient for postpartum psychiatric treatment was 85% higher for those with previous pregnancy loss. So if a woman had experienced a previous pregnancy loss, she had an 85% higher chance of having a postpartum psychiatric treatment event than after giving live birth than women who hadn't. And what was really, really fascinating about the details of this research is over 99% of the women who had a history of mental health treatment one year prior to their loss. So again, they have a loss followed by a live birth, but one year prior to their loss had a mental health event, exactly one year, 99% of them required a postpartum psychiatric treatment after their live birth. Now, Jorn Hughes um, also has re um, released recent research regarding women and their experiences after loss. He studied 5,331 women. Out of those, 214 had an induced abortion, 331 had a miscarriage, and 1,156 had a live birth. And what he found was, following both miscarriage and induced abortion, women experienced temporary declines in overall life satisfaction. So after any type of pregnancy loss, those women experienced overall a decline in overall life satisfaction, and it showed persistently lower satisfaction in several domains of life. Now again. We don't know were there pre-existing factors prior to the pregnancy loss that contributed to significantly lower satisfaction over several domains of life, or was it the loss the precipitating event of those? Women who had abortions did have pre-event levels that were lower in satisfaction across most domains that he studied. However, again, they continued, continued to show persistently lower satisfaction over time in several domains. So where does all of this research lead us, leave us? I love this quote by David Ferguson in the Psychiatric Bulletin. He said, these divisions within the field have been heightened by an unfortunate tendency for research findings to coincide with the positions that the authors have taken in pro-life and pro-choice debates. And that has been true consistently over time. That doesn't necessarily mean that anyone is falsifying their reports or um, intentionally misleading public, but it does mean that maybe there's some confirmation bias happening or maybe what they're initially seeking to find, the research is set up looking to find that information rather than following where the research is taking them. And so I kind of looked through and dug through the wording and David Reardon's research that was just released in 2021 and Hugh's um, research that was just released. Um, Reardon seemed to have a more balanced approach in his extrapolations for previous research. He really didn't talk about previous research that much when he was introducing his new research. Um, when he did reference it, it was very fair, talking about the varying, um, varying evidence that we found from that research. And his language was really nuanced and balanced. He talked about pregnancy loss repeatedly. Um, Hughes' analysis used the term future child when discussing grief of those who experienced miscarriage. 
And I apologize to anyone out there who have may have had a pregnancy loss. I myself have had a miscarriage and an abortion, like I mentioned earlier. And parents don't talk about the loss of their pregnancy as the loss of a future child, especially women experiencing that loss. Women who have gone through the labor of miscarriage or experienced a DNC in miscarriage talk about their loss as the loss of their actual child. It's not a future child, it's not a potential child. So that verbiage alone lets me know what his frame of view is when looking at research or setting up research or extrapolating evidence, what evidence says about research. Grief counselors don't address miscarriage loss or abortion loss as future child. We talk about what the loss actually was, whether it was a loss of pregnancy, if that's the woman's words, or if it's a loss of their actual child, if that's the woman's words. So to wrap this all up, I wanted to also add in the difference between lived experience and research parameters. All this research is great. It gives us all a picture of the potential risks that are correlated with abortion. But does it actually tell us what women are experiencing? I am a part of a few abortion recovery private groups, and I'm not gonna tell you where those groups are located because as soon as we find out, we have lots of people trying to shut us down. Um, but there are thousands of women a part of these abortion recovery groups. And women come the day of the abortion, the day after their abortion, 20 years after their abortion, talking about their regret and their regrief of abortion. These women's reactions to their abortion are multifaceted. They change over time depending on situations and they don't really depend or are, and they're not really informed by women's legal or political perspectives. So there are pro-choice women that are part of this group and pro-life women that are part of this group. And it's same for the men in these groups as well. Men are part of these groups and some of the men are pro-choice, some are pro-life, but they're all experiencing abortion regret or grief. And um, in research that Coleman had done that was published in 2017, really encapsulates what we're seeing actually when we're doing abortion recovery work. Available data do suggest that many women, high risk or not, report a mixture of positive and negative feelings across the full time span, from the discovery of the pregnancy to many years post procedure, with the balance of positives versus negatives changing with time, intervening with life experiences, and time to reflect upon those experiences. And that's really what we see when we're dealing with women, whether it's whether I'm dealing with women professionally in my practice, or if I'm dealing with women um, in the abortion recovery programs or my own experience with abortion. It took 19 years for me to acknowledge I actually had an abortion and then it took some deep healing to work through that and I'm still processing that loss and I will forever miss my son and wish he were with me. And so I wanted to give you an indication of why more women don't talk about their abortion regret. This is a screenshot of a conversation that happened last night on Twitter. I was talking, someone had posted the Turnaway study and I talked about my own abortion regret and about the thousands of women in abortion recovery groups worldwide that talk about theirs. And the response I got was what we call gaslighting. The, this is from a reproductive, reproductive justice organization. So you would think they would have some level of professionality or respect for women, but instead, they chose to take my regret and turn it around as if it was manipulative or just anti-abortion rhetoric, or it was meant to shame women. And that's why we have regret is because women are shamed or manipulated by anti-abortion tactics. And I thought it was really interesting that an organization that's supposed to be pro-women would talk to a woman expressing openly her abortion regret not talking about politics at all regarding whether or not it should be legal, but just pointing out research um, and talking about other women experiencing regret, they would try to shut that down. And I really want people to understand this is a lot of the, why, the reason why a lot of women don't wanna openly talk about it, whether it's response from pro-life that talks about, oh, you're a murderer, or if it's response from pro-choice, oh, you only regret it because you, your church tells you to. Neither of these responses are respectful of women. And I will add that too of women that talk about not regretting their abortion. We shouldn't be gaslighting them either, telling them that they will or that they're terrible. We should explore why. Why did they seek out their abortion? What do they think their abortion did for them? Oftentimes it's societal issues that could be addressed in different ways. And we need to explore that and find out why exactly 
Are they grateful for that experience? So at this point, I'm gonna open it up to questions. Okay, let me pop down here to the question answers. Has there been any federally funded research on the mental health effects of abortion in the United States? That's a really, really good question. I don't know if there's been direct funds from the government to study this, but I do think organizations doing research on abortion may have had some kind of grants um, but I don't have any data directly for that. So I don't wanna speak directly to something that I just don't have the data for, but I do think there have been some grants in that area. What does the word turn away refer to in the turn away study? Again, like I mentioned earlier, the word turn away refers to the women that were turned away from having abortion. A question from Monica. Hi, Monica. When you say studies find X percent increase in negative mental health reaction and Y percent is directly attributed to abortion, does that imply causation for the why? Yes. So what Monica is asking me is in those studies that said um, this many percent of, percentage of women had an increased risk of suicide after abortion, but 5.8% of those women, we can directly attribute that risk to abortion. Yes, it does imply causation. Great question. So that's all the questions I'm seeing so far. Um, I'm definitely open to more. Let me pop over. Oh, what, someone's saying, wait, they have more questions. Is there any research showing the negative effects after the abortion pill versus surgical? That's a really good question, Debbie. Um, I know there's been research regarding effects after surgical abortion and research regarding effects after pill abortion, and then research regarding effects in general. I don't know if there's research that spares out specifically one against the other. I know in a, the abortion recovery groups I'm a part of, it doesn't really matter which way women experience it. They still have similar abortion regret or guilt or um, PTSD type symptoms of the event. Um, I can tell you personally from my abortion pill experience, um, it was horrendous and graphic and painful. And so um, I definitely don't wanna minimize the idea that abortion pill experience is not a difficult experience. And surgical abortion has its own whole other world of you go in pregnant, you leave empty. And that's a really bizarre feeling for women. What does the consumer research done by support after abortion add to our understanding? That's a really good question, Dr. Roebuck, and not one that I can answer. So hopefully someone from support after abortion um, can comment on that. I will say, as I was gonna wrap up a little bit later, um, Janine commented um, during the her talk of consumer research on the number of people needing support versus the number of people asking for support. So I would say the huge disparity between the number of people experiencing mental health complications and people asking for help does indicate there's some issues there with regard to are they not being screened appropriately when they're seeking out mental health support? So whether that's presenting at the ER or presenting at a private practice like mine or community mental health, are we actually screening for abortion um, or are we screening for mental health complications related to reproductive issues? When you compare women with unintended pregnancies who abort to those who carry, isn't there concern about mitigating factors that would wake women feel prepared to carry is that is are these the right comparison groups so let me think through that again monica when you compare women with unintended pregnancies okay who who abort compared to those who carry isn't there concern about mitigating factors that would make women feel prepared to carry i'm not really sure what you're asking there um if you're asking whether we should look at comparison between women who abort and women who carry and both being unintended pregnancies, if that's what we should be researching. I actually think we should be researching all different kinds of comparisons. Um, women who um, have never had pregnancies versus women who do and their different experiences with loss is really fascinating to me. The comparison between miscarriage and abortion is really interesting to me and those both compared to live births. I do think if we narrowed it to unintended pregnancies, it would help us to see how women are handling those. I will say the turnaway study 
um, did address all unintended pregnancies. And I did find it really fascinating that all the women, almost all the women turned away became pro-life and really happy with the decision not to abort. Um, thanks so much for the positive comment and Camille, I appreciate you. So Christine's question, when someone says they don't regret their abortion as I do, if I ask them why they don't regret it, where do I go from there? That's a really good question. Thank you so much for asking that. I would say, first of all, it's really good to ask them, what do you feel the abortion did for you? How did it help you in your life? And questions should follow from there. So just to give you an example, if they say, well, I didn't feel prepared to have a child. I was in college and um, my boyfriend wasn't committed and I was financially struggling. You can ask them, had there been supports that you were aware of that would have been able for you to both have housing, secure housing and attend college, would you have made another decision? Did you feel like you were pressured into abortion by your situation? Maybe not the people involved, but your actual financial or educational situation. Did those feel pressures? onto the abortion decision. Um, is there any comparison between the turnaway study and another large long-term survey-based studies in terms of typical retention rates of survey participants? I don't have a comprehensive answer to that question, Monica, and I can look into it more for you um, and try to get you answers to that later. I know that all long-term survey-based studies have retention rate issues, which is why I tend to prefer to look at studies regarding medical records to see um, correlation. But I have yet to see any study that I feel like really represents women's nuanced experiences with, with abortion. And I have some ideas about how those studies should be done, um, but I'm not a researcher. So that's something I'll be working with AppLog on moving forward. How do these figures change when a woman has had multiple abortions? That's an excellent question. Um, and it's not one that's always considered in the research. Sometimes in the research, they don't separate that out. Um, for every additional abortion, we tend to see increased risks of both physical and mental health complications. And I hope that was just a really short, helpful answer for you. Is there a study comparing men and women's reactions after abortions they both wanted? Not that I'm aware of, although there should be. Earlier, you said most of the women turned away and the turnaway study became pro-life. How is that measured? That's um, direct report from them to the researchers. Um, there's actually been some really interesting um, video footage of women talking about their experience being turned away. Um, and um, I'll see if I can grab that. This whole um, seminar is going, to, or this whole talk is going to be a link that's provided later. So this will exist in perpetuity. So um, I will try to include both all the resources I had in a slide, as well as a link to that video for you. So you can watch women talk about their actual experiences and how they became pro-life. Is there any difference in women who went to confession rather than going to recovery group first? Also have any women reported value of confession? That is not something that I'm aware of has been studied. Um, I will echo what I've heard echoed throughout the day, which is women's abortion recovery journeys are all varied and all different. And I think what's valuable to a woman is what's valuable. Um, some women really value that experience of confession and I would encourage that for them and some women that that aren't religious or wouldn't find value in that may find value in other things. So I want to encourage all the different types of professionals and groups that women think would be valuable for them, as well as to be respectful of women who don't want to participate or wouldn't find that helpful. Who has asked the researchers from the Turnaway study for their data and questionnaires? And did they simply not respond or did they overtly say we won't give those out? I know that those who have written up um, rebuttals to the turnaway study have requested the information. I don't want to give specific names because I don't want to misrepresent anyone in particular, but I know individuals that have reviewed it have asked and it's been refused and they've been refused. Um, I don't know the wording behind the refusal. Because you use mental health terms, um, PTSD instead of post-abortion syndrome, do you note that the PTSD is related to abortion or pregnancy loss? In my private practice, yes. So I have women coming in who have extreme um, stress-related reactions to abortion. 
And if their symptoms match the criteria for PTSD and it's related to that event, yes, the very first criteria for PTSD is being um, directly involved in or being a close relative or family member of someone who has died. And so that's a very first criteria you have to meet for PTSD. And so, yes, if I'm diagnosing PTSD, it's related to a death event or a severe um, sexual assault type of event as well. Um, so yes, it would be directly attributed to that. Although I have women who have PTSD for a variety of reasons and that necessarily isn't necessarily the only one. Is it possible women are being mistreated by men in society because men are post-abortive? That's a really good question. Um, I would imagine so. I don't know that we've ever tracked it or researched it. I would say that when I went through my own deeper still retreat, um, it was very healing to offer my apology to the men in the room for on behalf of women seeking abortion and to have them offer their apology um, at, on behalf of men who are participating in abortion. That was really healing for both of us. We needed to have our, um, our side of the abortion acknowledged and our parenthood acknowledged by the other side. You mentioned that there are thousands of women and men in abortion recovery groups, and these include pro-life and pro-choice individuals. Can you comment on how this position, life versus choice, is represented in this population? I don't know if it's tracked in the abortion recovery groups. I'm not an admin on those groups um, or a leader in those groups. So I don't know if that's tracked by them. Um, it's definitely not the main focus of the group. The main fo focus is abortion recovery and informed consent for women considering abortion. Um, so I really couldn't say. Um, I will say repeatedly, women and men involved in the groups don't care um, what their position is. They just want healing. Where can we get the turnaway study? Um, if you mean, it depends on what you mean. The white papers on the study, the study itself, the book, there's lots of different places. I would simply start with Google and see what you can find there and branch out from there. All right, I can take one more question and I got to wrap this up. Is there research on the correlation between religious views and mental health recovery? Not that I'm aware of. I will be looking for that though after today's talk. Okay, so to wrap up this conversation, um, I just wanna remind you that this will be, it, or has been recorded, so it will be available later. And I will make the slides available along with a slide including all the resources that I used. And I just wanna tie in some themes from the talks I heard earlier. I was not able to listen to all of them, but I listened to four of them. Um, and Janine's talk, she talked about the number of people needing abortion recovery compared to the number of people seeking it out. And Georgette's talk, she talked about how we talk about um, abortion and women who have had abortions and how that's imperative to their healing and their recovery. Um, Catherine Davis talked about how currently the abortion industry really sets the stage on how abortion is discussed and how we need to take back the narrative. And if we're going to take back the narrative, we need to do so carefully. We need to make sure we are not gaslighting women. We are made to make sure we are not intentionally harming men or women who have experienced abortion, we need to be extremely respectful and engage with civil discussion. If a woman is discussing her abortion experience, please do not turn the conversation to politics, at least not immediately. Explore her reaction to abortion with her um, before you ever bring politics into it. And Lisa Rowe discussed the need to change in the pro-life movement and how we um, react to women post-abortion, which is what I just commented on. So I hope you can see throughout the day how all of these um, themes that people have brought about um, are supported by mental health research and abortion. And I just want to say thank you for support after abortion for having me. Thank you all for listening for your amazing questions. Those were wonderful. Um, I feel very honored to represent both the voice of women who have had abortions and regret it or have grief about it, and also the mental health community. I hope that the mental health community will step forward um, and start to acknowledge the fact that we are treating women with PTSD, panic disorder, acute stress disorder, um, major depressive disorder. Um, and I also hope that the mental health community moving forward would be willing to join a network that I'm putting together on behalf of APLOG. And I believe Lisa Rowe from um, Support After Abortion will be joining me. We're putting together a network of licensed professionals who acknowledge that this hurt and pain exists and want to treat it with respect and dignity. So look forward to that coming out in the future. 
But thank you all for coming and I wish you a very blessed weekend.